Leanne, first of all, thank you so very much for joining us. And uh, second of all, congratulations on Apollo's recent milestone, celebrating 25th anniversary. So that's, that's certainly no small feat. So for, uh, for those in the audience who are not as familiar with Apollo's accomplishments, perhaps we could start the conversation with two or three minutes on your perspective, where you started in 1990, and how the firm has evolved since. Okay. First of all, uh, thank you, Mo, for the nice welcome. Uh, I, my apologies for uh, being late. We uh, were held on the ground for By about the way, they don't 45 know. minutes. You don't know. It got they switched. don't know that. I was supposed to be your 4.30 speaker, mm -hmm. but, uh, but happy to be here at 5 with all of you, too. Um, so, 25 years. That's, uh, that's up there with being married for 33 years. <laughs> so, uh, both I view as great feats. Um, I spent 13 years uh, at uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert. Um, Drexel uh, was a very unique experience. I'd say 12 years there uh, were spectacular, rocket ship um, uh, going all over the universe, and then the last year was a disaster uh, as the <laughs> rocket uh, crashed and burned. Uh, out of those ashes, um, <coughs> My partners and I uh, founded Apollo about four months uh, uh, after uh, Drexel's bankruptcy. Uh, we were helped by uh, the one-stop shop that was afforded us very luckily. Uh, sometimes luck is as important as anything else. Um, and uh, we had the backing of uh, a large French bank, uh, Credit Lyonnais, which was 90% uh, owned by the French government. Uh, and they backed us uh, with about $800 million of capital, um, about half of that their own capital in one fund, uh, which was a, a managed account. Uh, and then uh, they also helped us raise our first $400 million uh, account for uh, Apollo. Uh, and if you remember back in the spring of 90, uh, the world was going through a uh, fairly sizable recession. Um, uh, originally, they had wanted to uh, have me uh, get involved in building them an M&A platform, and I said there was no M&A. Uh, the, the, the credit markets were sh totally shut down uh, at the time, but that if they would back myself and some partners, uh, we thought there was a lot of undervalued uh, opportunities uh, that, that we could uh, get involved in, both from a buyout, uh, from a restructuring, from a distressed approach, uh, as well as uh, uh, managing a high-yield portfolio for them. So that's where we started 25 years ago. And uh, fortunately, we've had a lot of good breaks over the last 25 years. Uh, and today, uh, if you look at Apollo, um, we're basically doing many of those same things. We're uh, involved in uh, PE, uh, we're involved in credit, and we're involved in real estate, uh, which we also started with, with Credit Lyonnais back in 93. Uh, only we've gotten a little bigger uh, during that, that period. Today we manage about $165 billion uh, of, of assets, about $40 billion of it is in our, what's been our most profitable area, which is private equity. Uh, and uh, our fastest growing area has been credit. Uh, we've been helped by a couple of major secular trends since the last downturn seven years ago, one being low interest rates uh, so that many pension funds uh, can't meet their 8% uh, liability bogey uh, investing uh, in investment grades, so they need to really look at alternatives. And secondly, uh, all the, the draconian uh, regulatory uh, uh, restrictions that have been placed on banks, investment banks, also were very nice uh, tailwinds uh, for us to grow our credit business, which today uh, has grown from about 20 billion just seven years ago to about 110 billion today. And then finally, we've rounded out uh, with, with real estate uh, of about 15 billion uh, that, that, that we manage. 
Um, we have about 15 offices globally, uh, about 365 uh, investment professionals uh, uh, at, at Apollo. Well, it's amazing what you've achieved in that time. So how would you describe Apollo's overarching, uh, call it investment approach, investment philosophy, and how would you differentiate that from your peers? Okay. At our core, since day one, and, and the reason I gave you a little bit of the history, besides that that's what you asked me to do, uh, is, is to say that not that much has changed other than the scale. Since day one, what has always defined us as being a value investor, uh, being a contrarian investor, being an investor who doesn't mind dealing with complexity uh, if it gives us the opportunity to buy down our price uh, in terms of uh, companies and investments that we're making. So I think as opposed to many of our peers, and many of our peers um, are very successful, uh, and there are many roads to Rome, um, uh, but our secret sauce has always been uh, to stay as a value investor. Um, and we have gone about it uh, in a number of ways. So what do I mean by a value investor? I mean that we like to buy uh, good companies at low prices. And uh, a lot of people say that, uh, but the fact is we've developed multiple pathways in differing economic environments that have enabled us uh, to execute on that plan. So what are some of those pathways? Well, pathway number one, uh, is we're very comfortable investing in down cycles, in uh, distressed situations where the company is in distress, not because its operations are bad, uh, but because its balance sheet was over levered. Uh, and so we, one of our hallmarks has been to be able to uh, analyze, and this goes back to my, my Drexel training with uh, Mike Milken uh, and the whole high yield um, um, revolution that, that he uh, fostered. Uh, is, is to analyze the balance sheet uh, and buy at deep discounts the debt of good companies with bad balance sheets, uh, buy enough of the debt to matter in a restructuring, uh, and uh, end up to be in a position maybe to uh, get control of those companies through a, res through a, a restructuring, which is a delevering process. Uh, about half I'd say overall in private equity, about 35% of the capital we've put to work over the last 25 years has been put to work in the four recessions that have occurred during that period, during distressed periods or down cycles. The beauty of that approach is that I think if you know what you're doing there, about half of the capital we put to work in distressed situations, we succeeded in getting control of very good companies uh, with, with bad balance sheets, uh, whether it was companies like Charter uh, Cable uh, most recently, or Lion Dell Bazell, uh, or even going way back to our early starts in Vale Resorts. Um, but uh, half that capital ended up with us being able to transform those restructuring situations into uh, ownership, a la very nice PE investment. The other half, uh, where we, quote, failed to get control, uh, we failed basically because either we couldn't get a large enough debt position because the market moved away from us, or because somebody else came in at the end of the restructuring process and said, we'll pay more for this cleaned up company. In those situations, uh, we, I think, averaged about a 60% IRR on our debt positions, uh, and we got to recycle that. Um, but but um, uh, uh, we, we, we weren't successful in getting control, and, and that 60% IRR was only over a short period, usually up to a year. Um, but a very nice way, our entry multiple into distress is about a five EBITDA uh, multiple. So your risk reward uh, was very favorable. But that happens during recessions. 
Another pathway uh, are what we call corporate carve-outs. Uh, these are corporate orphans of big companies that have a division uh, that they no longer feel is core to their strategy. And uh, they're usually undermanaged, they're usually undercapitalized, uh, they're complex. Uh, they usually take nine to 12 months to negotiate. Uh, usually you get a, uh, an opportunity to uh, have an exclusive uh, with, with the seller because maybe there's a sales contract that's ongoing um, uh, with the parent company. Uh, this isn't unique to us. We just happen to do more of them than anybody else. And one of the reasons we like these, even though they're more complex, is the average multiple we pay on those is about a six multiple uh, of, of EBITDA uh, on the entry, and these are very good companies uh, also. Um, finally, and that's about another third of what we do, finally the last third is more conventional buyouts. Uh, a la what others do. We have nine industries that we uh, feel we have some expertise in, uh, where we feel we can create some value in these companies. It is more competitive. Some of them are auctions. Um, and one tries to stay disciplined, but maybe those go up to a seven and a half multiple. The upshot of all of this, when you ask again our big differentiator, and I say we are a value investor, is that in this market environment, and we, our last fund was an $18 billion fund, the fund before it was a $15 billion fund, those funds were put to work at a six multiple on average in an environment where uh, deals done at over 500 million in the PE world in the last three, four years were at a 10 multiple. So this is very dramatic. Right. Uh, this isn't a one multiple difference. Right. This is a four multiple difference that comes out of, uh, uh, of this situation. So by definition, uh, these companies are being bought at lower prices. There's less risk uh, in them. They're less levered. And the upshot of it is that over a 25-year period with this secret sauce, we've generated a 39% a gross IRR, uh, and which translates to about a 26% net uh, IRR in our PE business. Mark. So that's that's the the differentiator. The last thing I just I'd mention two other quick things uh, that we do that maybe differentiate us is that we run our firm as what we call an integrated platform. What does that mean? It means everybody in credit. It means everybody in PE. Everybody in real estate. They talk to each other every day. Most firms silo them separately. They want to maximize their trading opportunities. We're willing to give up some of the trading opportunities and be restricted. We think it makes us a uh, better, better flow of business comes in and that we can be better investors if we can create an informational library with everybody talking to each other among the professional investors. Uh, the last thing I just say that differentiates us as we go to uh, extraordinary um, extents not to lose money. Um, we, we make mistakes like everybody else does, uh, and we certainly have had our share. Um, but one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is that even in not all, but in many of the situations where we've made mistakes, things have gone wrong. Um, we have rolled up our sleeves um, and fixed the problems. And, and just as that whole distressed discipline helps you on the buy with being able to buy uh, securities up and down the balance sheets of good companies. Uh, when a company gets in trouble and it's in our portfolio, um, we're willing to go in uh, if we believe in the business and have conviction uh, about it uh, and buy up the debt at deep discount, that may be trading at deep discounts and creating value that way. To fix a company, you have to be able to work on both the left and the right side of the balance sheet. You have to be able to improve it operationally, whether it's cutting costs or taking advantage of uh, acquisition opportunities. But you also, and that's something I think we've, we've been able to do a lot, uh, are, are, are able to buy in um, uh, securities when they're trading at a discount in the market and create value that way too.
So that's actually a great segue because over the past 25 years, you've had some uh, extremely high-profile deals. I mean, you, you, uh, transactions. You mentioned Lyndon L. Bazell, Hostess Snacks, Norwegian Cruise Lines. There were many others. When you look back at all those deals that you have done, is there any that are were particularly exciting for you? And and I would say, um, more importantly, which were the ones that you've learned the most from in terms of how you conduct business today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, just on that segue, so here was a company called Rheology. Uh, Rheology uh, is the largest real estate brokerage company, uh, I think in the Western Hemisphere, probably in the world. Uh, some of their brands included uh, Century 21, Coldwell Banker, ERA, Sotheby's, Corcoran, um, and we bought that, and we bought it at the top of the market, and uh, because we thought these brands were so good, we actually broke a little bit of our discipline and even paid a higher multiple than we would normally. And, uh, and we levered it, and uh, it was in trouble. And at one point, we actually had marked it in our portfolio at, um, I think, about 10 cents on the dollar. Um, and I think, you know, what we did is what I just described. We, we rolled up our sleeves and attacked both the left and the right side of the balance sheet. We cut costs by half a billion dollars. Uh, we actually uh, added um, some opportunistic um, uh, acquisitions. Uh, and we bought in a lot of the debt of, uh, of the company at deep discounts. Uh, and this process took, uh, uh, two, uh, I think, two, three, three years. Um, and lo and behold, we were able to, through the public markets, um, uh, exit making twice our money. Um, and uh, I think that, that you know, what, what you learn um, is a few things. Number one, after we did that deal um, and uh, there was one other large deal, uh, which we're still working through, called Caesars, um, where I'd, I'd say has similar characteristics. Um, uh, I think we, and those were both done, I think, in 08. Um, we basically have, have said there should be no exceptions to uh, paying higher multiples, no matter how good or how, how good the brands are, that that's just not us. Yeah. Um, and I think it also gave us the, uh, the feeling that, that uh, you know, it's never over till it's really over and that uh, uh, we, we, we have both the fiduciary responsibility to our investors, uh, but we also have our own reputations and pride uh, on the line. and. Uh, uh, that saving th those situations to the teams that work on them are even more important than making new uh, uh, investments. Uh, <clears throat> the, the other two that I'd mention, um, one was a deal we did very early on in our uh, history which uh, kind of put us on the map uh, back in 91. Uh, we got involved in the rehabilitation of an insurance company called Executive Life uh, out in California. Uh, and uh, we were able to work with our French partners at Credit Lyonnais to buy uh, their, their high yield portfolio. Um, uh, and that portfolio uh, was a six billion face portfolio. And we worked through it, talk about complexity between the, the regulators and the uh, the Fed and the insurance uh, uh, administrators uh, took took a long, long time, uh, and and bought the portfolio at about 50 cents on the dollar, and sort of divided it up into three parts. One was uh, those situations that we thought might be very good distress for control situations. Um, Two, uh, those that were just a nice high yield portfolio. Uh, and then three, a lot of dogs and cats uh, that we didn't think had a whole lot of value. Um, uh, 
And what ended up happening there, and that's, that's the lesson uh, of why it is really important to be uh, price disciplined, uh, is something we didn't expect. Um, the market just spiked. All those distress for control situations, we didn't get control of um, because they all parred out. Um, I think Vail was the one exception. Um, and, uh, and the high yield portfolio did, did very nicely. And the dogs and cats, instead of being worth a nickel and a dime, uh, we got very lucky quickly, uh, ended up being worth uh, you know, 20 cents. Um, so it, it turned out to be a, a successful um, uh, uh, transaction, uh, but not in the way we had originally envisioned it. The last one I'd mentioned is and the one that personally excites me the most today and has for the last uh, five, six, seven years is Apollo itself, uh, is building the company since we've taken it public. Uh, there's just a whole array of different challenges. Uh, one, growing it. Uh, two, trying to educate the market. Three, staying strategic in terms of doing things we're good at and not straying too much from that. Four, making sure we keep our good people and keep adding on uh, people. We've gotten more global uh, during that period. So that's, that's been a much uh, more complex, longer term challenging uh, transaction, and it's the one that, that, that I'm most involved in uh, now, and, and also making sure we stay out of trouble, which is key first and foremost. Yeah, you got to teach me how to do that sometime. Um, so we're actually entirely out of time, but I did want to squeeze in one last question, because you've, I mean, it's, it's extraordinary what you've achieved. And uh, I'm actually afraid to, to even consider what the next 25 years are going to look like for Apollo. But you're going to stay busy with it. What, what, what are some of your passions outside of the office? Could we take a minute or two to, for you to share that with us? Sure. Um, I have a number of passions. One, I have four fantastic children. Uh, I have two of them working with me. Uh, so spending, one is also a filmmaker who just moved out to California. And my one daughter, my youngest, is uh, in law school right now. So they, they are a, a great passion. Uh, two, I've always been an obsessive, compulsive, sicko collector of art, um, which is a good motivator to keep me uh, working hard. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that's something I'm passionate about, and that's why I'm involved with the MoMA and the Met and uh, the Asia Society and so forth. But I think the, the most recent passions of the last eight years, uh, which have actually been the one that's been the most fulfilling, and I know the sponsor here um, is, is a, 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 a kindred uh, cousin. Uh, my wife was diagnosed with uh, melanoma cancer uh, eight years ago uh, on the bottom of her foot. Uh, and it was stage two, and it was taken out. Uh, and actually, Mike Milken, who is a close friend, uh, who I worked with for 13 years, um, uh, his dad had died of melanoma, and he's done a lot of work with prostate cancer, uh, and he's been really transformational in the field. Asked whether we would start a melanoma research uh, foundation, uh, and, and we said, yes, we would, but we didn't know a whole lot about running a, a, a scientific research cancer foundation. He said, let me help you since I know everybody in the field. And so we started eight years ago. We had our first retreat um, uh, that, that year. We had about 150 of the world's top scientists and doctors. And, um, and, and we, we put we put in 40 million of our own money into it, and we have since raised probably and levered about another 110. So about 150 million has gone into it. And the whole field has really been transformed in the last seven years. Um, melanoma today is the poster child for advancement in cancer research. Uh, the whole field of immunotherapy, uh, which is revolutionizing cancer research today, has been led by what's, what's been happening in melanoma. Uh, and, and we've now had 11 drugs 
that uh, which and we've actually been involved in funding all, all 11 of them uh, that have been approved by the FDA uh, in the last four years and and what what is so significant about this is it's not only doing incredible things for melanoma uh, but we're finding that with the commonality of biomarkers between different your genetic system between different cancer patients that a drug that may help 15 percent of melanoma patients will also help 10 percent of lung cancer patients will also help six percent of multiple myeloma patients so where this is all going is towards customized uh, a medical treatment and, and the development of cocktails as it did with HIV. Uh, and it's very exciting. And it's wow. also very exciting working with these scientists and doctors. I mean, I come from a financial world where the scorecard is, is money. And, and, you know, these devoted scientists and, and doctors, uh, they, they just want to do good and help the world and make it a better place. And it's, it's very inspirational and, and humbling. Yeah. Um, so, so that's been great. And then the last thing we've done is um, my family's been involved in buying some uh, publishing ventures. Uh, one is an art book company called Fiden, um, and uh, that's been fun because it's not only involved in, in art and photography and architecture, but it also has a big culinary line, so get to meet all the chefs all over the world, which you can see is also a passion. Uh, uh, and the other is, uh, has been a fun project that I've been doing with Yale University Press. Uh, for the last eight years, and we've now published 20 books. We have about 40 more under contract, and it's called the Jewish Lives series, uh, and it's readable biographies by different authors matched with different subjects uh, from Abraham to Steven Spielberg. <laughs> um, and the last one was on uh, Peggy Guggenheim and on Proust and we've done on King David and Einstein and Freud. And so that's, that's been a fun project. Of course, neither of these publishing things make any money. <laughs> it's a terrible industry. Uh, Amazon's killing everybody, but it's, uh, but it's, but it's a passion. Then you asked about passion. Well, that gives me a new goal in life, to make it into your library. Anyways, but Leon, you've been a gem. Thank you so very much for joining us, for flying up to Toronto to share your insights and experiences with us. We really appreciate it. In your honor, we have made a, uh, a donation to a local hospital in support of cancer care, and we have a small gift uh, to give you for you to hopefully to remember us by. Thank you. Thank you so very much and for joining thank us. Thank you so much, and thank, thank you. you all. Cool.